Kevin, nice to see you. So those words at a rapid pace from the Fed governor, Leo Brainerd, really spooked the markets. Should they have? Not necessarily. Remember, this is all part of the Fed's TNT program to help combat record-setting levels inflation, with the first T, of course, being to taper their monthly bond purchases, which they've now completed, the end being narrowing or shrinking the size of their balance sheet. That's very important because by selling off bonds on their balance sheet or letting bonds unwind without repurchasing new bonds with those uh, matured premiums, allows and impacts the longer end of the curve. And of course, the last T being tightening. And that's what everyone seems to focus on with respect to raises to the federal funds target rate. So it's really a combination of all three of those. And if they were to just raise the federal fund target rates, you'd see more potential yield curve inversions because those interest rate increases impact the shorter end of the curve, whereas balance sheet reductions impact more of the longer end of the yield curve. Kevin, the Fed has said that they're going to be extremely data dependent. When do you believe that the impact from these rate hikes would show up in some of the economic data where they're also going to be playing and paying close attention to to see exactly what that impact is at the end of the day? It's a fantastic question. I still don't believe they're going to be as aggressive as some in the markets now believe, or even as their most recent dot plot suggested with a median Fed funds target rate of 1.9% by the end of this year and 2.8% by the end of next year. This is all within the context of an economy that's still growing, but yet slowing. So how aggressive does the Fed want to be to help try and combat inflation into an environment where the economy is starting to slow? If inflationary pressures start to subside during the second half this year, perhaps the Fed won't be as aggressive as many now think. And in terms of outside pressures that the Fed is keeping an eye on, obviously what you referenced, March Madness, not just on the U.S. basketball courts, but also reverberating through global markets. We know that the EU is eyeing even more sanctions on Russia. What are you pricing in right now? How much is the market priced in, in terms of the uncertainty from this? Yeah, it's certainly been a very difficult start to the year. March was actually a good bounce back month for, for U.S. stocks and certain international stocks. But investors have so much to grapple with right now, as you correctly point out, whether it's persistent record level setting uh, levels of inflation, whether it's the uncertainty over how aggressive the Federal Reserve will be or how much worse this Russia invasion into Ukraine will go. But with that being said, there are still opportunities for investors, specifically as it relates to a rising rate environment. Whether you believe they're going to uh, raise rates six, seven, eight times this year, we're in a rising rate environment. And our research shows that certain sectors of the stock market tend to outperform others during rising rate periods. And investors may want to consider those sectors when they're allocating their assets over the next two to three years. Speaking of March Madness, the market volatility can't come close to matching last night's game. I hope everyone saw it, but we will stick to the subject matter. Those sectors in this volatile environment, given the rate hikes coming, what are they and where should we focus? The great question. Of course, I'm wearing my Carolina blue tie today, even though I'm shedding some Carolina blue tears uh. after their loss last evening, but I digress. Those, those top performing sectors are information technology, energy, utilities, industrials, and financials. Historically, if we look back to the last four rate hike cycles, those are the five to six sectors that have performed best on average from three months prior to the first rate hike to three months after the last rate hike. So if you can narrow in on those companies that have a history of growing their earnings, pay a good dividend, and also are well positioned to withstand a slowing economy, we think there's both growth and income potential for those stocks. Kevin, more EU sanctions that would signal that the ethos of globalization that was there and in place pre-pandemic and pre-international conflicts is perhaps no longer there, at least at the same type of scale post-pandemic. And so what does that mean in reality for how people are positioning their portfolios and some of the companies that they have invested in with the idea of their growth measures that they've put forward in different parts of the world? 
Yeah, it's a good question. And certainly Europe is much more impacted at this point as it relates to the sanctions being placed on Russia, the necessary sanctions being placed on Russia, as they get roughly 25 percent of their oil from Russia and nearly 40 percent of their natural gas from Russia. That can't be replaced overnight. The U.S. has much less of a dependency on Russia, but still certainly has a dependency as it stands right now. So that places even more increasing inflationary pressures as it relates to those energy commodities, in addition to certain agricultural commodities as well. So investors would be wise to account for those inflationary pressures, allocate to those sectors, again, that have performed well historically when rates are rising. And remember, even as rates rise, they still haven't risen. So dividend paying stocks and certain other areas of the market that pay attractive levels of income, such as preferred securities or even municipal bonds, are worthy of consideration as well.